Today we're making the ultimate Japanese rice bowl dish, oyaku donburi. In Japan, you'll find it served all over the place as a very popular street food. You're not gonna find it much in the States, however, but it's totally worth making it yourself at home. It incorporates the simple but deep flavored combinations of premium soy sauce, kombu, sake, mirin, all with a chefy omelet on top. What's happening team? I'm Jet Tila and this is Ready Jet Cook, where I show you how to make my favorite Asian dishes from pantry to plate. Let's get started. So Dombri in Japan is a collection of basically rice bowl dishes. Um, and to make them, I'm gonna need to grab premium soy sauce and some sake. So we're making oyako donburi, which means parent and child. And in this case, it basically means chicken and egg. But you can get beef donburi, curry donburi, pork katsu donburi. I could go on forever, but this is gonna teach you the base. I'm gonna start by making the sauce, which is also the marinade for the chicken. Most donburi is made from this formulation of sauce. I'm gonna start with premium soy sauce. I know, man, it is so confusing because there's a thousand types of soy sauces. For this dish, since it's Japanese, use a Japanese soy sauce first, product of Japan, and premium soy sauce really refers to the way that they are making the soy sauce. This is a brewed soy sauce, and the soybeans are naturally fermented. Basically, it's kind of like there are a lot of levels of wine. This is not the two buck stuff. This is the nice 15 to $20 stuff. So it's gonna have more body, better flavor. And this is what you're gonna wanna use for good cooked Japanese food. So next is gonna be sake right into the marinade. Sake in Japan just translates to booze. So everything is sake, beer, wine, spirits. If you wanna really impress your friends, this is called nihonshu. Nihonshu is made of rice and it's fermented. So again, sake, okay, but nihonshu will make you sound like a pro. Next key ingredient in Japanese cooking is mirin, a sweetened version of sake. It's made of rice, it's fermented, so very key when creating like teriyaki sauces, noodle sauces, and especially donburi sauce. Next ingredient, kombu. So kombu is a kelp leaf. They harvest it from the ocean, and that's what we're looking for, that natural sea salt that's gonna create a ton of umami. So what we're gonna do is just throw that into the sauce, and we're trying to extract that top layer. Last two ingredients you know really well, sugar, and then just a little bit of water. There it is, we've just made donburi sauce. This can sit out until we're ready to cook. It only gets better as it sits. So next, we need to cut the chicken to marinate in the sauce. So yes, I'm using chicken thigh because chicken thigh has fat and flavor. I'm just cutting it into nice thin strips. Skinless, boneless thighs, chicken breast if you must. Both will work great. I'm gonna grab a separate bowl to marinate the chicken with. I'm gonna take a little bit of the marinade to marinate the chicken because remember, this is a marinade and a sauce as well. So let's get this coated very well. Let's talk about rice. This is a Japanese rice bowl, so A, we have to start with Japanese short grain rice. Easiest rice to make in all of the Asian rices because the ratio of water to rice in Japan is one to one. So one part rice to one part water. Steam, which means simmer for 20 minutes, and this is what you get right here. 20 minutes cooked, 20 minutes rested, and you absolutely want to be fluffing your rice before you serve it. So in Asia, you know, the rice bowl also symbolizes your business, your marriage, your house. So yo, don't go breaking rice grains because it's bad juju. For the donburi, I'm gonna preload the rice bowl and I'm not seasoning the rice at all. I want a decent bed of rice so the beautiful donburi egg and chicken can sit right over the top. All right, so that's ready to go. Scallions, root, Tip, let's get rid of that. I like to cut it right where the whites meet the greens, and then a nice thin bias slice. The onion here is to be sauteed with the chicken, so I'm gonna keep it nice and thin. I like to cut them in half and then peel them. See the rainbow? Uh, make sure the root end is on your weak hand side, and just slice thin. And don't eat a lot, because I'm just making two rice bowls. All right, in Japan, donburi is made with these amazing little donburi pots. There are two pieces, the handle which attaches to the pot, and then the lid, so you fire the little meat and egg in here, 
and you cap it, let it steam out. And once you're done, you grab it and you slide it right over the rice bowl. These are not easy to find, but you don't need them. If you can find them, super fun. But in America, everyone's got an omelet pan, okay? So six to eight inch omelet pan. We're gonna get that over high heat. So first step is to add a little bit of oil. I wanna get my eggs ready. So as that pan is heating up, I just wanna make sure my eggs are beaten together. And I'm looking at my pan to see that oil getting right to that point where it's gonna start to smoke. So a nice searing temperature. So we're in it, we're ready to go. The oil is getting quite hot. I'm gonna start by putting a few pieces of chicken in there. Remember there's sake in the sauce and it can be flammable. And then I'm gonna put some onion in. I want that chicken to sear, uh, get about 75% cooked through. I want those onions to brown and get super sweet. It's time to deglaze this with more of the sauce. So I'm gonna add half this sauce because this recipe makes two beautiful domberries. What's happening in the pan is all of that fond, all the chicken and onion pieces that are brown stuck to the pan are basically just creating more flavor. The sauce is actually now deglazing, lifting it up. Once I bring this to the boil, the sauce kind of reduces a little bit, picks up all the flavors and helps cook the chicken through. The liquid is coming to a boil. It's starting to reduce. I wanna make sure my chicken is just a little bit more cooked through. What's gonna happen is I'm gonna throw my egg in there it's gonna create this loose raft, almost like a custard, and all that flavor is gonna get suspended in this raft. We're gonna place it over the rice bowl, and it's gonna be this kind of self-basting experience. All right, here we go, this is what I'm looking for. I've got a nice simmer, and I'm gonna just throw my eggs in. As you can see it immediately already starting to congeal. I'm gonna throw my lid on, and we're gonna watch this egg start to absorb that liquid and create this kind of custardy, beautiful omelet. So like I said, back in Japan, when you're actually watching these street vendors do this, you can see up to like eight to 10 different donburi pots, and each one could have a different filling in it. It is pretty awesome. So what we're looking for is that fluffy egg to congeal in the middle, but not be overcooked. Uh, we gotta get that rice bowl ready to go, and let's check it out. Oh yeah, oh yeah, look at that. It's this gorgeous chicken egg little omelet. It's hard to call this an omelet, but I, I think it's an omelet. So I'm looking for a rice bowl that's the appropriate size, so when I slide this omelet out, I get all that juice, look at all that, and I get it right on top, like a lid. Oh man. This really is the ultimate Japanese comfort food. These are molten lava hot, so do be careful. Mm. It's so fluffy. And although there's chicken and egg in there, it's cooked so tender. All that sauce has concentrated and based the rice. I hope I've introduced you to the world of donburi. This specifically is oyaku donburi, the chicken and egg don. Go ahead, make this, order it. It's gonna be your new favorite rice bowl. Thanks so much for cooking with me today on Ready, Jet, Cook, and I'll see you next time. So today I'm making salmon miso yaki, which translates to miso grilled salmon in Japanese. It's a staple in my house, and it's a super simple, delicious way to prepare salmon fillets at home. I'm gonna show you how to select, prepare, and cook this dish like we do at the restaurants. What's happening, guys? I am Jet Tila, and this is Ready Jet Cook, where I show you how to make some of my favorite Asian dishes from pantry to plate. Let's do this. Uh, Japanese, there it is, perfect. So for miso yaki, I'm gonna need mirin, sake, and ginger. Sake and mirin are actually cousins. Mirin is made from sake. Both have alcohol, both brewed from rice, but mirin has sugar in it, so it makes it sweet. So when I think about flavor profiles, you wanna use mirin to sweeten dishes, you wanna use sake to give that kind of burnt rice aroma. Fun fact, 
In Japan, the word sake just means all alcohol, all booze, beer, wine, etc. So if you want to look like a pro, sake is called nihonshu in Japanese. And then finally, we're gonna need some ginger for this misoyaki. When picking ginger, look for very large hands of ginger instead of small nubs like this, and make sure the ginger is bright yellow to pale yellow. As the ginger ages out, it starts to turn kind of blue, and you don't want that stuff. You know what, it wouldn't hurt to to snap a little finger off just to check, and there you have it. So the last thing I need is miso paste. Now, there are several types. This is shiro miso, which is white miso. So it goes from white, yellow to red. The deeper you get, the saltier, the more earthy, the more umami you get. It's basically fermented soybean paste. I mean, it's, it, there's a lot more flavor though, right? The fermentation creates a lot of umami, that, that delicious savory note. So just think about this like a soy sauce paste, but it's so much more because there's a lot of layers. It's a really balanced flavor profile. Let's get cooking. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is actually make the miso yaki glaze. But this dish is a twofer because you're also gonna learn how to perfectly grill and season salmon. So the first thing we need to do is actually start the glaze by cooking down some sake and mirin. And the way I'm gonna do that very carefully is to preheat whatever vessel. This is a saucepan, but you can go bigger. Now it's very important, okay, that you're actually gonna pour the sake away from you. I want you to preheat your pan or your saucepan to get it like ripping hot. And very important, if you're cooking in a kitchen that has a low kind of hood space, you can actually just bring it up to a boil from cold. Don't try to flambe if you don't have a lot of hood space. So here we go. Hold your bottle thusly away from you and I'm just gonna pour away from myself and there it is. So what you're looking for is for the flames basically to ignite and then go away. And that means the alcohol in this sake is cooked down. So the next ingredient is gonna be mirin. It also has alcohol but a lot lower by volume. This is gonna give us the sweetness. So mirin, similarly to sake, is an alcohol made of rice. In America, we call these two things rice wine, which is kind of a misnomer in my opinion, because right, wine is made from fermenting of juices. Now these are grains, right? So rice fermentation is a grain. So in my opinion, these are more similar to beer. I'm gonna stick to that one because I think I'm right. So sake is cooked off, the mirin is boiling. Again, the pot is ripping hot, so do be careful. But you can actually see the sake is reduced almost all the way, like 75%. The mirin has also reduced. All those aromatic flavor notes are concentrated. It's time now to add sugar. So it's very important to dissolve this sugar 100%. The sugar is gonna do a few things, other than obviously being the sweet in here, it's also gonna give you that kind of syrupy glaze, right? It's gonna marry amazingly with the miso and give you this clingy, delicious glaze. Another thing I'm looking for is that pale yellow look of a reduced sake, which I'm getting now. At this point, I wanna reduce the flame because with all the sugar and the actual thickness of the syrup, it's gonna boil over quickly. So it's miso time. And you know, like I stated, I'm using a yellow miso here because it's the mildest of all three misos. And I'm gonna work that right in. If you've never tasted miso paste by itself, it's not as sharp as soy sauce, right? It doesn't have that deep saltiness of soy sauce. It's got a lot of savoriness to it, almost a sweet floral quality to it. It's a phenomenal ingredient anywhere you're looking for just a little bit of salt and a lot of savoriness. There we go. So as the miso is working in, I'm gonna turn up the heat just a little bit. And my job here now is just to make sure I whisk this in so it incorporates completely smooth into this sauce. All right, so the miso is incorporated perfectly. The sugar has dissolved. That is becoming one beautiful glaze. So I'm gonna turn this to low and I'm gonna show you a phenomenal ginger trick. It's kind of one of those ingredients that makes people go, why is this so delicious? Yes, I could use a planer, I could chop ginger, but I'm gonna show you a way to get just the pure ginger pulp without any skin or fibers. Check this out. Common box grater, you want the smooth, small holes. I'm gonna take a piece of cling film and just stretch it over. You don't have to wrap the entire box grater. Now take the actual ginger. We're gonna break off one finger. Uh, don't worry about peeling. 
all the magic will happen right here. And the goal here is to get straight ginger pulp, right? I want all the deliciousness of ginger melting into this sauce without grabbing any of the fibers. So just a, I would say light to medium pressure as you go back and forth, and then watch what happens. Check that out. All of the fibers and the skin ends up there. And what you get concentrated on your grater is 100% pure ginger pulp, just like that. Great for sashimi, phenomenal for this dish. So I'm gonna get this into the pot. I wanna get the ginger in and make this a beautiful kind of glaze. Again, what am I looking for? I'm looking for one kind of perfect consistency, viscosity that'll coat the fish really well. And this is my chance to actually taste it because the sauce is practically done. Mm. The saltiness and the savoriness comes from the miso. The sugar really kind of supports it, and that ginger just pops perfectly. So if you're not gonna use this miso sauce right away, just put it in the fridge in an airtight container, and it is good for weeks. So, sauce is done. Let's focus on fish. The issue is the salmon filet is kind of a rectangle. It's kind of a pros versus Joe's situation. When you take a rectangular piece of fish, you just cut a block off of it and put it on the grill. It doesn't look super cool. I'm gonna show you how chefs deal with this rectangular piece of salmon and make it look like, you know, a piece of art culinaire. Watch this. All right, so first thing I'm gonna look for, this is skin on. We don't need the skin, but I like to leave it on because it keeps the moisture and the fat in. And what I'm gonna do, instead of just cutting a perpendicular block off the right here, watch what I do. I'm gonna take my knife, angle it 45 degrees, start in a little in from the left edge, and watch what happens. Use that blade and let it do the slicing for you. You know what, you eat with your eyes first, so I think it's really important to have food that looks cool. So I'm gonna cut my third piece off the fish now. Perfect, now I'm making sure to disconnect the actual skin. Now that first piece there in a restaurant, I would totally use that because I have one side that's sloped and the other side that's flat. Let's save these for later and focus on our three slices. So whenever I'm buying salmon, a few things that I'm looking for, right? I'll let your senses be your guide, okay? So visually first, I'm looking for a really nice bright orange. I'm also looking for a translucence. Like it should look wet, right? But not slimy, there's a big difference there. And then if you are at a piece of salmon, you can actually get into, you wanna touch it. I know, it makes uh, fishmongers crazy, but I mean, don't bruise the salmon, but you wanna push it down gently and it should bounce back. The third sense that I rely on is my smell. So if you're close enough to the salmon, it should smell sweet like the ocean. So those are the three quick tips on how to pick salmon. Fancy salmon cuts are down, and this is actually called karimi in Japanese, yes. Like French have knife cuts for everything, so do the Japanese. So off angle is called karimi, which is what I've done here. And I'm simply just gonna season with salt and pepper on both sides. One side is totally seasoned. Let's go to the other. I'm using kosher salt, just in case you're wondering. I do like a coarse kosher salt or a flake sea salt. So the seasoning is adhered. Let's talk about the grill. So I'm using a grill pan, right? Few critical steps that ensure really great grilling without sticking. Preheating is number one. And number two is make sure that grill has been cleaned from that last use, which this one obviously has. And I'm relying on that seasoning of the grill, which I can see that this grill has been used, it's been cleaned right. So it's built up a very natural nonstick surface, which is called seasoning. And what you can do to guarantee less stick is to pre-oil the salmon. I'm gonna show you how I like to do it. You know, my buddy Tad and Allie, they give me a hard time because, you know, I like using pan spray. So what I like to do is I'll take the seasoned salmon and I hit it with a little bit of spray oil. And you know what, I use the canola because I think it has a better smoke point, it has a higher temperature. And I'll do both sides before I lay it on there. I think spray oil is the best thing since sliced bread because it's a controlled spray, it doesn't get goopy, it gives you that perfect mist for what we gotta do here. This is a grill pan, obviously, so not the kind of grill that has the flame shooting through. What I do is put my hand about two inches above, and if I can't hold my hand there for about four to five seconds, then I'm good. Another thing I'm looking for is a little smoke, and I've got both of those things right here. Grill is at the perfect temperature. My fish is oiled and seasoned. So what I'm looking for are for those kind of raised areas, and I'm gonna go down and away from me. One, two, and three. There we go. So important. Don't mess with the grill, friends. Let the grill do its thing. You're getting heat from the bottom. The bottom of this fish needs to sear, almost needs to cauterize, get those grill marks in. What you can do is use your eyeballs. Again, lean on your senses. What I'm looking for is a color change from orange 
to kind of that grilled brown color. And that's gonna be the first indicator to see when it lifts up. And another thing is there's only one presentation side on food. So I wanna nail a beautiful grill mark on one side and you got two chances for this. If you don't get it here, you can get it on the other side. But I'm not always focused on fish having to be cooked 50% and 50% top and bottom. I wanna nail that grill mark on one side and then I wanna get that temperature kind of medium to where just the salmon starts flaking apart. Because I've let that fish basically sear on the bottom, I can get in and it's not sticking and I'm not getting a big oil slick on the bottom of the fish. And I like these grill spatulas a lot. I think they're the perfect thing because they're flexible and they get in. So watch, pull back, over, perfectly grilled salmon every single time. Boom. It's that simple, friends. I love this dish for a few reasons. When I was in my 20s and I was going to sushi school, part of the rituals of working in a restaurant is everyone takes a turn cooking family meal every week, all right? So although we were working on sushi for 12, 15 hours a day, I would look forward to family meal. There was one chef that I worked with who made this salmon misoyaki, which is a very home style dish. And like, I fell in love with it. We were playing with all these exotic ingredients, but you know what, the highlight of my week was when chef would make salmon misoyaki. So I stole that from him and he stole that from his grandmother and I'm giving it to you now. So this is why I love this dish so much. So the way to check doneness is unscientific. It's a little more art than anything. I'm pressing down in the middle and it should just give, right? It shouldn't push down and it shouldn't be so firm and rock hard, which is telling me that this fish is just cooked through. And again, I'm going in with a fish spatula to wiggle it first. And if it wants to come up, it is done. So let's land these so we don't overcook them. That is perfect. And in case you were wondering why I didn't do four pieces, four is a bad luck number in a lot of Asian countries. Uh, look it up, it's a cool little fun fact. So it's time to put it all together. I'm going with brown rice, but any grain will work here. If you're kind of going grainless, cauliflower rice or zoodles would even be really cool. So boom, a little kind of one side versus the other there. And then I'm gonna land my fish kind of over like it's swimming. It's kind of that art of plating. Let me plate this this way on the plate. I'm gonna turn it towards you. And I just need to simply sauce this. What you wanna do, if the sauce has been hanging out for a little bit, guys, make sure you get a little stir on there. And if it's tightened up a little too much, add a little water or a mirin, either one works. And I'm gonna kinda of just go right over the top and then over around the plate. Another thing you could do if you really like that kind of lacquering or that big time saucing, is take a nice brush and get the brush in there and really kind of laminate that sauce in there. Oh man, that looks delicious. So important to get enough sauce for every bite of rice is what I like to do. And then for simple garnishes, I love sesame seeds. I think that looks beautiful. And then um, I always cut some scallions on the bias and just make a little bit of garnish there and on the side. That's amazing. That is salmon misoyaki. Last thing left to do, I mean, you know the last Tila rule of cooking is to taste your food. The perfect bite, in my opinion, is a good piece of salmon, smother that rice with sauce, and you gotta get a decent amount of scallion. I'm gonna crush that. Mm. I mean, that dish hits on so many happy levels. You've got kind of that delicious salmon taste. You got the sweetness from the sugar. You got that mirin, you got the miso that kind of ties it all together with savoriness. This is my idea of a perfect meal. So there you have it, friends, a homemade salmon miso yaki with, you know, grandma's sauce that we stole from my other chef, but now it's yours. Hope you guys enjoyed the show. We'll see you guys next time on Ready, Jet, Cook. Today I'm making a classic Japanese miso ramen with chasu pork belly. Now the Chinese may have invented ramen originally, but over the past century the Japanese have taken the dish, perfected it, and really popularized it around the world. Now it's time for me to show you how to make it in your kitchen. What's happening guys, I am Jet Tila and this is Ready Jet Cook, where I show you how to make some of my favorite Asian dishes from pantry to plate. Let's get cooking. Right, miso ramen. So I'm gonna talk about miso and pork belly when we get into the kitchen, but we gotta spend some time on kombu. 
So this is a giant kelp leaf, grows in the ocean. You take it and you dry it and it becomes this. That drying process creates this natural sea salt. It's been done this way by fishermen for a thousand years. The amazing flavor this gives is actually what MSG was synthesized to actually taste like. But this is savory in its most natural form. We are using kombu for the savory profile, and it really is the essence of umami. The word umami literally translates to the spirit of flavor. That's how important it is, and that's what kombu is gonna give us. I'll show you how to use it in the kitchen. Pork belly, miso. So for the miso ramen, I need pork belly. Make sure to get skinless pork belly because those skins will not break down in time. It'll be chewy like rubber bands. And also I'm using red miso, also known as Aka miso. There's three levels of fermentation, white, yellow, red. Basically the more fermented, the more pungent, the more salty. I'm going with red because it has the most flavor, the most punch, and I think it's super delicious. So, Lots to do, but we're gonna make it very simple. There are four very popular styles of ramen and they're basically classified by their broths. So first we're gonna be making miso ramen today, which uses miso as the primary ingredient in flavoring. The second would be shio, which is the Japanese word for salt. So salt basically flavors um, the broth, which obviously has bones in it. And then there's shoyu, which is the Japanese word for soy sauce. So you have a dark soy sauce broth. And and then there's tonkotsu broth, which is a very fatty bone broth. All very popular. Today we're gonna to be making a miso broth. And we're actually gonna start with a soy sauce marinade to cook the chasu, which is the pork belly, which is the same marinade, which we're gonna marinate those eggs. I'm gonna teach you how to make those really cool uh, ramen eggs that are just soft in the middle and coated with soy sauce. So uh, in a cold saucepan, we are going to start with sauce. Okay. And you know, a lot of Japanese chefs work in formulas, right? Meaning I'm gonna go about two parts sake to one part soy, which makes it really easy to kind of think about measuring and then the rest will be sugar because I want a balance of flavors. We've got the flavorings and now we're gonna need the aromatics. So the aromatics for this soy broth is going to be ginger. And whenever you're cutting ginger for a marinade or a quick broth, we don't really have to worry about, you know, perfect cuts. We just want to expose as much surface area as possible. And with scallions, I'm just going to chop these in half because we're going to end up removing these later. Ginger, scallions, and then finally, a little water to dilute and give me more base for the bellies and the eggs. So we're gonna get the soy broth overheat. We wanna dissolve that sugar, and then we're gonna divide it in half. Half this broth is gonna be for the pork, and the other half is gonna marinate the eggs. And I'm gonna show you how to make those really cool ramen eggs that you see. It's a very fun little tip. What I'm gonna do is insert a little pin inside the bottom part of the egg. And when I mean bottom, the wide side, because an egg kind of tapers into kind of like a point, we want that bottom side. And all I'm gonna do is take a little pin to the top of that and then poke a little hole. There's a natural little air pocket in there. And what I'm gonna do is relieve the pressure from that air pocket. And also this allows the hot water to get in there to help kind of poach that egg out. So that's all we're doing. We're gonna do that to every single egg and you won't lose any egg that way. That's gonna get the hot water in there and allow you to make a perfectly boiled six minute egg. Once I poke the air hole in, I'm just going to lower the eggs into boiling water for six minutes. That's gonna give you that soft yolk in the middle without the yolk setting up. And I'm actually dropping these eggs right in from the refrigerator. No need to room temp them. That soft, creamy center of the egg is a six minute egg from a cold egg in the fridge. Eggs are cooking away for six minutes and I'm gonna separate half this soy broth now to marry those peeled eggs in and then use the other half to start poaching the pork belly. I just warmed this broth enough to dissolve the sugar. I'm gonna be pulling half of it out for the eggs and cooling it. All right, so soy broth is good for eggs. I'm gonna start working on the pork belly. 
I'm trying to be thoughtful about order of operations. I wanted to get to the raw pork at the end so I don't cross-contaminate. And we're gonna start poaching this in the liquid. You may see pork belly in ramen that's rolled. You can absolutely roll this and tie it and poach it, but I actually like the planks when you see the planks of pork belly. You may know the word char siu from Chinese roast pork. It's the same concept, except this is the Japanese method of braising char siu versus roasting it as they would in Cantonese cuisine. These need to braise for about two and a half hours. You have two choices. They can go stovetop or you can cover them tightly with foil, put it in like a 325 oven for about two and a half hours and you're golden. So we're set up for miso broth, but first I wanna spend a second on the eggs. After six minutes, these eggs are done. And what I wanna do is stop the cooking process as fast as possible, which means an ice bath. So these will go into the ice bath. We'll let those chillax a bit until they are room temp and then we'll peel them. So here in the center of my board, I've got the broth that we made that the pork belly is simmering in currently. I have peeled the eggs that we've cooked for six minutes. And look at how gorgeous these eggs come out when you poke that little hole and you cook it just for six minutes. So these are gonna swim right in that soy broth. And what it's really doing at the end of the day is just creating flavor for that egg and making them nice and beautiful because after they live in that broth for, and I would recommend at least 10 hours, check that out, man. Look at the difference in color. You can't oversteep because you're not cooking anymore. You're just creating a beautiful, what I call a soy ramen egg. We're gonna need the soy eggs in a minute to finish this ramen. For now, let me actually get you into the miso ramen broth. I've got three pots on the stove. I just wanna explain what they are. This is the pork belly that's simmering away. I've got a center pot to actually cook the ramen noodles. And this is the little saucepan we're gonna be building our ramen broth in. I'm heating this saucepan up. I'm gonna put just a tiny bit of high temperature oil in there just to saute the pork up. So ramen is supposed to be a rich, luxurious dish. I'm always looking for a fattier ground pork. I like to brown this pork because it builds more layers of flavor. Caramelizing basically pulled all the sugars and those meaty, smoky notes out. So this is going to be the base of our ramen. We've got a lot of things going on in here. So I'm gonna toast up the shiitake mushrooms. This is gonna beef up even more savoriness. I want garlic for that kind of deep earthiness now. I'm gonna take the widest part of my knife, smash that flat. You have to keep in mind, everything that's going into this ramen broth is not gonna be pulled out. So make sure you cut things fine enough to sit in this ramen broth because we are not straining this out at all. So I'm gonna get this all sauteed up. All right, I'm gonna be adding ginger now, and I want the ginger pretty fine, so I'm gonna use my handy box grater plastic tip. Just take some plastic, lay it over the small smooth holes. Don't even bother peeling your ginger. You just wanna grate it right onto the plastic, and this works amazingly because all the fiber ends up here, and all my usable ginger pulp is right there. I grab that and marry that in there. I mean, as you can see, I'm building layers of flavor, the mushrooms, the ginger, the garlic, and now the scallions. I mean, I'm only getting so much amazing flavor out of there. So I need scallions for the broth and I'm gonna want some scallions for garnish. So uh, if there was smell vision you would be getting roast pork and ginger and garlic and now scallions. Check out the pan with me. The whole idea here was to cook that pork and really start blooming all the flavors in this pan, but I don't want this broth to come to a boil. So I'm gonna reduce my heat and start adding my liquids now. And the base liquid here is going to be chicken stock. You can absolutely make your own chicken stock, but I'm using a box stock. Going for a bit of water. So this is the point we bring in our red miso. When you buy your miso, I really want you to taste the miso on its own because I think it's important to understand what each ingredient brings to the dish. And the best way for me to describe miso flavor, first I would say it tastes like soy sauce because it shares so many ingredients with soy sauce, but I think it has more body to it, right? And it has even a deeper savoriness without having all that salt. You can see how rich this broth is becoming. I'm gonna add some sesame oil for aroma, not too much. 
and I like the spice of a chili garlic sauce. So with the chili garlic sauce, you can see the connection between cultures with chili garlic sauce, with soy sauce, the ginger, and the noodles. It's a pretty amazing story, kind of similar to sushi because sushi was actually a Chinese way to preserve fish, and then the Japanese took it and made it this amazing phenomenon. This is mirin, which is a sweetened rice wine, which gives you a very kind of nice tone of sweetness. I'm gonna be adding white pepper, salt, and then one more hit of sweetness to balance out all those flavors, just a little bit of sugar. I know it seems like there's a lot of ingredients, but ramen I think is part alchemy, part art. You know, as much as it is, you know, uh, a culinary feat. The last ingredient I'm gonna add is our kombu. I want you to remember this. Boiling is the enemy of kombu, so there's a specific reason I'm putting it in at the end. As the temperature rises, I do want to cook all the ingredients in here, but I don't want to cook the kombu too much because the flavors you're trying to get out of kombu are those outer layers of that kind of dried natural sea salt. You don't want to get down into the green because it starts to taste a little too strong. Let me show you what the kombu looks like and the actual parts of it that I'm trying to extract flavor from. So this is a big kelp leaf. And as you can see, these dry, beautiful, almost sea salt patches on here, that and the outer layer is the flavor I'm trying to extract. Whenever you cook any of my recipes, taste the ingredients by themselves mm. to understand what they add to the dish. I mean, it's like part sea salt and amazing amount of savoriness, and that's what we're going for right here. So I'm just gonna break a bit off, and I'm gonna add the kombu to the broth, and we're just gonna let that simmer. Remember, the enemy of kombu is boiling. So this is gonna simmer for a few minutes. I'm gonna cook my noodles off, and I'm gonna pull this amazing dish together. Ramen bridges two culinary cultures that I'm fascinated with. One I come from, which is the Chinese, and the other I grew up cooking, which was the Japanese. You know, Chinese American kid going to Japanese culinary school and cooking Japanese food, this is the dish that bridges it. You know, I've always been in search of the perfect cha siu. And in the, my Chinese side makes red roasted sweet cha siu. The Japanese training has taught me how to make, you know, this perfect ramen cha siu. When it comes to making broth, all these ingredients are shared between two cultures. It's very similar to cultural anthropology, right? I'm obsessed with understanding the cultures better through trying to find the best version of the dishes. The miso ramen broth has simmered for about 10 to 20 minutes. I have noodle boiling water going. I want to cut my cha siu and get that ready. Look at that. Oh yeah, that's what I'm talking about right there. So with the cha siu, you could actually cool it and hold it in the fridge and cut it as you're using it. I'm gonna be using it fresh right out of the pot. And what I'm gonna do now is just slice a few tiles off to prepare it for the bowl. And I'll probably do three to five. So four is a bad luck number in China and Japan. No, I can't help it. I'm sorry. Whenever there's cha siu, I need to eat it. Noodle water's going. These are fresh ramen noodles. You can find them at the store. If you're using dry, that's okay too. If you're in a pinch, any egg or wheat noodle is gonna be fine. I'm gonna load an order into my noodle basket. That's gonna go right in. So these noodles will cook for about two minutes and I want them on the al dente side. So we're getting very close to plate up. I wanna set up my bowl and my garnishes. This is your last chance to finalize your ramen broth. So give it a good taste and adjust as you need here. Mm. There are all those layers of the herbs, spice and sweetness. So it's gotta be a very balanced flavor. Noodles are in, we're gonna ladle in the warm broth. And I'm gonna leave the kombu and the mushrooms in the broth, I'm not serving those. But those are gonna continue to give flavor to the broth. Let's lay in the tiles of pork belly. I'm gonna show you that soy egg. And I've actually taken these out of the fridge and let them warm up a little bit. Don't put them in the ramen super cold. So I'm just gonna slide my knife in. That's what I'm talking about. I'm gonna tuck those in. A Little bit of bean sprout scallions, and I like to finish with nori. And just kind of like a little deck of cards, I'm just gonna tuck it right in there. 
Just a reminder, friends, this recipe is better the next day, meaning the cha siu can be cooled, served the next day, the eggs also marinated for the next day, and the longer this broth goes, the better. And you've actually learned three recipes in one. The ramen eggs are fantastic for breakfast. The cha siu can be for anything for noodles, fried rice, or eaten over white rice. And this broth is just a fantastic base for anything you want to eat with it. Don't be jealous. The crew is so mad right now, you have no idea. So there it is, we have made spicy miso ramen with homemade cha siu together. I hope I've inspired you to tackle this dish, or if you're out eating ramen next time, please order the miso ramen. We'll see you guys next time on Ready, Jet, Cook.